So it is Monday the 12th, 2021, and we're in physics for the first time for like forever, I swear, in a face-to-face -face physics class. Uh, there's good old Mark's face, smiling face there, I see him. Um, even when we're not face-to-face, -face, Mark's still hitting me up with stuff, so it's okay, y'all can feel free to. Um, so we're going to talk today, we're going to start talking about rotation, but I just kind of want to go back and rehash a little bit from the first couple lessons of what I really feel you kind of need to know from the first couple lessons, right? So the first couple lessons, some of the things we covered in the first couple lessons were obviously the, the main thing we covered are Newton's laws, right? Um, there was an intro to physics class that kind of talked about the basics of physics and science and the, you know, the scientific method is kind of the major thing that I covered. And the scientific method basically states that, you know, if, you, if you're going to research something, it has to be researchable, first of all, right? We can't exactly say that we're going to research the atmosphere of Venus right now with people because we just don't have the ability to get them to Venus yet, right? But we could research how in physical therapy, how patients respond to certain treatments. And in order to research that, we have to have a hypothesis. Right, we have to come up with this kind of question that we're looking for. That question has to be able to be proven wrong to be valid. And I think I mentioned in it talking about like football, how I could say that, or I could even say right now that the Vegas Golden Knights are the worst hockey team in the NHL. I can't really prove that. So that's not a valid hypothesis, you know, because the worst how, right? The worst doesn't say anything. Could I say that the Vegas Golden Knights currently have a bad record in the playoffs? Sure. Could we prove that? Yeah, because they've lost a couple years in a row. But that doesn't mean it's bad, right? Bad how? Well, are they the worst scoring team? Are they worth? So we have to quantify what we're saying is the worst, right? If we're going to say this is the best treatment for total knee replacements, the best how? Is it the best to improve flexion? Is it the best to improve extension? Is it the best to relieve pain, right? We have to be really specific when we're doing research. And then like I said, that led us into talking about like the three main laws of Newton, right? Newton's first, second, and third law. Where Newton's first law is that law of inertia, basically stating that an object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, unless acted upon an out by an outside force, right? The earth is going to stay in rotation around the sun as long as that the sun has a gravitational pull, right? The only thing that would change that is if we impacted something that would change it, right? If all of a sudden Venus got in our flight path for whatever reason, that would change the state of earth's rotation. Um, I, I joke briefly about, we had actually a uh, congressman who asked, I don't know if you, have any of you seen this video, but it kind of hurt my head watching it. We had a congressman ask, to talk about global warming and address global warming. And he said, well, have we thought about changing the distance the earth is from the sun or changing the distance the moon is from the earth? Yeah, and Mark laughed a little bit about that, right? Um, and my, and I, when I post, I post that on Twitter, and there's a great clip from Justice League Doom where, um, the, where Superman suggests that to save the Earth. And Batman makes the comment of, if I had a week, I couldn't explain all the reasons why that wouldn't work. That's where we're at now, right? We, we can't change the, the rotation of the Earth, right? We have to change what we do on the Earth if we want to affect global warming. But maybe in the future, who knows? Maybe in the future, we have the ability to move the Earth's gravity, you know, in the, the rotation of the sun by, I don't know, 20, mil, 20 meters or something like that. That might affect us. Who knows? But we're not there yet. We definitely don't have the ability to change the Earth or the moon at this point. Um, the Earth is just too massive. But, you know, for us, even with us, and you think about it, right? When you first start going to the gym, man, when you first start going to the gym, it's hard. You have a lot of inertia against going to the gym. And then as you start going, it gets easier and easier, right? Your inertia picks up. You're getting that momentum going forward. So the law of inertia even applies to that. It just states that as we move, we continue to move more. If we stay kind of sedentary, we stay sedentary. And the larger we are, the more mass we have, the more inertia we have. That kind of makes sense too. I felt over the, over the pandemic, I felt my mass going up. 
I had gained quite a bit of weight. And I'm like, man, I've got to lose this because the more weight you get, the harder it is to move, the more your body strains, stuff like that. So mass affects that love and that love inertia as well, right? Now, there are all kinds of people that came along that talked about that, right? We, we had Galileo, we had Copernicus, and Isaac Newton was kind of our main guy that came in. He also gave us this idea of free fall, right? We could actually calculate if we drop a penny off of the, um, the stratosphere, we can calculate how long it's going to take to hit the ground because we know its mass. We can actually figure out. And we can also calculate what velocity it's going to strike at, right? If you have somebody down under the stratosphere and you drop a penny off and it hits them in the head, are they going to have a bad day? Yeah, right? Not a good idea. Good, right? Especially if something maybe even higher than that, like the Empire State Building. There's a reason why they have those big fences up all around the Empire State Building, because people used to throw stuff off of it. Why? Because, well, we're stupid people. Let's just face it. We do stuff like that, right? And probably if we didn't have those fences up there, I wouldn't doubt that people would be like bungee jumping or like paragliding off of it or something stupid like that. Yeah, right? A, a, a penny from that height is pretty painful. I remember back in Pennsylvania, we have a, a park back there called Hershey Park. And it's like the big amusement park in our area. And back when I was going, there was one roller coaster there, actually two. There was the Comet, which was the old wooden roller coaster that broke your neck as it went around corners because that's what wooden roller coasters do, right? They just basically make every bone in your body hurt after you get off them. And then there was the, what's called the super duper looper. And it was one of those roller coasters that did multiple loops. I'll never forget, I was at the park with a friend and there's a walkway that goes under the two loops, which is really smart on their part, mind you. Let's just say it is. And I was going under that walkway with a friend and somebody on, on the loop evidently lost their glasses. And they're at the peak of the loop and those glasses came down and just literally cracked into my friend's shoulder. And it split his skin under his shirt from the glasses falling just from that height. So we know that objects from higher distances have a lot of velocity, right? Think about it, if a, if a pilot is trying, if, if they know that the plane is going to crash, is it gonna be better for them to slow that plane down as they hit the ground or is it better just to speed it up and just take it all at once? Slowing it down is gonna be the better option. Right, give you more of a chance of living. It's just because that law of inertia. Right, that was kind of its first law, and then he also talked. We also talked about his second and his third laws. Right, where the second law was the kind of global, um, the global rule we've all a uh, formula you've heard of in physics. Right, force equals mass times acceleration. So the faster you're going, the more mass you have, the more force you have. Right. I like to think about that in football because I used to play football and I'm, I'm a big kind of football guy. When I played football back in the days, we had big guys, right? But those big guys weren't exactly the fastest guys on the field. So they didn't have a ton of force, but they would stop people because of their mass. But man, now if you ever watch the football combines and stuff like that, not only are they big guys, but good Lord, you've got these huge 300 pound linebackers doing four, seven forties, right? And they're just massively fast. And so when they hit somebody, it's no doubt now why we have so many injuries in the NFL, right? It's because they're basically turning into human missiles. And the bigger you are, the more mass you have, right? The more force you're going to hit with, right? And what is, whenever you see an NFL video, right? It's not like it's like, the best dancing on the sideline videos, right? NFL sells videos that are the hardest hit videos, right? That's what they make their money on, those type things. And we know a lot of those hits that are delivered end people's careers, right? Or in the long term, end their lives because of concussions and traumatic brain injuries, which we'll talk about in another class. Same thing for you guys, right? You know that you're, you're driving down the road and you see a car that suddenly turns sideways in the road you know that the slower you hit that car, the better it is going to be for you, right? Because the less force you hit it with, the better your outcome is going to be. The force is going to be lessened. Obviously, the best would be to avoid hitting the car. So that second law looks at the relationship of force, mass, and acceleration, understanding that they are all kind of in relation to each other, right? The greater the force, you either have a high mass or a high acceleration or both. 
And then that third law is the, the, good, the one we always kind of equate to Newton, right? We equate Newton with gravity, and we also equate it with the third law, which is that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, right? If I were to smack Mark upside his head, he'd get mad at me, right? That would be his, op that would be his uh, opposite and equal reaction, or he might smack me back, one of the two, I'm not sure, right? But as I'm smacking his head with my hand, I'm um, just using this example, I would never do that, his head is equally smacking my hand, right? Have you ever like hit your hand off something? Or in my case, I remember I was, I said, I think I talked about this in the lecture. I had a, uh, one of those speed bags in my old apartment and I was working on the speed bag. And for whatever reason, I missed the speed bag and came through and then hit the retaining wall behind it. And when I did that, my fist hit the wall, but at the same time, that wall is hitting my fist with equal force. And yeah, I didn't punch a speed bag for a couple of weeks because my hand was pretty well swollen. Um, back when I took my black belt test way back before most of you guys were born. I'll never forget one of the breaks I had do was a stack of wood like that high. And it was with just a simple back fist break, which is coming down striking with the back of your hand. I let my father set up my break, which I never should have done because when you're breaking boards, you break with the grain. The grain goes one way, you break down through the grain. Well, my dad turned two of the boards in the middle of it, not knowing how it was supposed to be set up. And I didn't check it, my fault. As I came down through, I went through the first three boards, and I think there was 12 total, and I hit those, those two that were cross grain, and my hand just bounced. And it was at that moment that I knew I messed up because all of a sudden I was just like, oh God, my hand hurts. And literally it just instantly became a basketball. And of course my instructor being compassionate, he's like, suck it up, fix the boards and break it with your other hand. Oh, thanks. I'm gonna cry now. No, you're not gonna cry, right? The board struck back with equal and opposite force. And that caused a lot of damage. My hand actually broke my hand in about seven places that day, which sucked. So that's Newton's kind of second law talking about it. We also talked a little bit about momentum and the ability to change an object's momentum and how things are affected when we look at that. But the idea for the first couple of lessons is really talking about how mass relates to the way we do things. It also relates directly back to physical therapy again, right? The, the larger the patient, the more we are going to be required to move that patient, right? You go into a room with a patient, you didn't look at the chart and you get in there and that patient is 800 pounds and you didn't look at the chart and you need to get them out to the chair. Is that gonna require a lot of force on your part to get them out to the chair? Yeah, right? It's, it's going to require some energy to get them from that chair to the next chair. That might be the time to go, hmm, my force is not going to be enough, so let's get some help so I can have two people moving that patient, right? So I don't destroy my back. So those are the main concepts, right? Or we make it easier, right? Well, I, what if I don't have the force to move that patient? Well, I can get a lift, right? I can get a lift to get that patient out of the chair. I could use a sliding board to help to get them out of the chair. That's where these concepts come in with physical therapy is looking at how we can maximize our own force. One of the things you're gonna talk about in third semester and the other group just got done with this with Dr. Sokel is body mechanics and using your own body force to transfer and move patients. It's physics, right? It's using either acceleration to get them over to places, using your own bodily force to lift and move them. There are all kinds of techniques we'll teach you that even somebody smaller like Stephanie can move a bigger patient. I've moved patients that are four or five times my weight just by, well not five, five would be a thousand pounds. That'd be a heavy patient. The biggest patient I've moved is about 700 pounds, but I've been able to move them by using their own kind of body weight and inertia against them. If I get them leaning forward, their own inertia is gonna start them moving because the body weight is gonna react to gravity. And that's kind of recapping it. Leverage, exactly, that's a big deal. Leverage is a great TV show too, but that's beside the point. All right, so we're gonna talk about rotation today. So let me bring that up here because this is gonna be how the world turns. Rotation. 
And this is going to be important because we're going to talk about a couple ways that we actually use rotation in physics, or not in physics, but in therapy as well. So I got you brought up. I got the chat brought up. There we go. So let's talk about rotation. So when I say the word rotation, what do you guys think about? What is anyone, what's people, what do people think about? A wheel. Good. Right. What about you, Mark? What do you think? I was just going to say circular movement. Yes, yeah, circular around. movement, right? When I think of rotation, the big thing here in Vegas I think about is the uh, the thing down at the link, right? The, the big old spinning wheel down at the link. That's one of the things I think of just because I can relate to that. We're, we're going to use that as an example here coming up. So we're going to talk about rotational movement. We're going to talk about revolutions, rotation, rotational speed, how that applies to torque how the center of mass and gravity apply to that, and then centripetal versus centrifugal forces. So when we're on a merry ground, right, when we think about it, what is going to move faster, the horse towards the inside of the rails, like inside of the merry ground, or the outside, right? Well, that's going to depend, right? It's going to depend on a couple of things. Are we talking about its rotational speed, or we can talk about its speed in relation to somebody else watching it? Because those are two different speeds. Right. And then like a hamster, all it's rotating around an axis, the hamster rotator revolves. So we're going to talk about answering these questions by discussing the difference between these rotations and revolutions and also angular motion versus rotational motion. So the two types of circular motion that we deal with in physics are a rotation and a revolution. So when we talk about that, the first thing we have to discuss is an axis. Right, so an axis is the straight line in which a rotation or revolution occurs. When an object turns around an internal axis, meaning that the axis is inside the body of the object, this is called rotation or spin. So if I'm doing circles, I'm just sitting here and I'm spinning around in my chair. Right, I just keep spinning around in my chair. At that point, I am rotating because the axis is going down through me. Now, if Mark and I link hands and we spin around in circles, at that point, the axis is an external axis because now it's where our hands meet. And that is called a revolution. And the way I always remember it is that an external axis has an E in it. Revolution has an E in it. So that an object that rotates around an external axis is revolving. One that rotates around an internal axis is rotating. So for those of you that have kids, when those kids stand up in your room and just start spinning around in circles for absolutely no reason, at that point, they are rotating. But if you grab a hold of them and spin them around in a circle, well, now you are the actual axis, which is external to them. So they are revolving while you are rotating. That's kind of the idea of that the, the eye downtown, right? So down at observation, the Las Vegas observation wheel or the high roller at the link. The wheel itself is turning around an axis while the riders are turning around the axis of the wheel. So that means that the wheel itself is rotating, right? Going around an internal axis. So you just look at the wheel. But the people on the outside of the wheel are revolving around because the access is external to them, it's in the middle of the wheel. Now we could make that more difficult if we made those little carts they're in also spin because they could be both then rotating and revolving and then we get vomit, right? The earth itself, the earth both rotates and revolves, right? It rotates itself around an internal access every 24 hours. That's the rotation of the earth. And then it also revolves around the sun every 365 and a quarter days, which is why every four years we have leap year, right? So to make up that day that we didn't really calculate for. So let's think about your tire for a second. The wheel itself, right? The wheel itself is rotating because it's rotating around a, a internal access, but the tire 
is not actually on its own internal axis. The tire is on the outside of the wheel, so the tire is technically revolving, right? So the tire and the wheel are doing two different things. That's why we talk about RPMs and stuff like that with the tire. That's where we're going to get into rotational speed now. And rotational speed, we're going to talk about looking at things spinning from a distance. If I'm watching something spin from the outside, or if I'm actually on the spinning object spinning around in circles, right? So there's this term called tangential speed. Tangential speed is kind of the speed that you feel as you're going around. It depends on how fast something's spinning and also how far you're away from the axis itself. So we have a turntable is a great example of this, right? The turntable itself is going to rotate around an axis. But if we put a ladybug on that, that turntable and put it, so turntable is the thing that we put records on. For those of you that don't know, records are these things we used to listen to. Yeah, exactly, Alex. So one of those carnival rides that move in a circle and the people are standing up and then the floor drops out, right? We're going to talk about how that centripetal speed works and how that keeps you against the wall in a little bit. But in this case, let's think more along the lines of a merry-go-round, right? So when we get on a merry-go-round, let's say that you have, you have motion sickness a little bit. You don't like getting on rides that move a lot. Even in cars, you might get sick. But you've got your child or you've got your godchild or you've got your cousin and nephew or whatever, and they want to get on that merry-go-round. And you know, I'm, if I get on that merry-go-round, I'm going to get nauseated because it's going around in circles and it's just motion. Well, the motion, that motion sickness trigger is triggered by the speed. So if you can get closer to the middle, your tangential speed will be a little bit different than if you're all the way on the outside because you're closer to that access and you're less likely to get nauseated, right? That's why a lot of people that have problems like riding high-speed rides, like a roller coaster or something like that, they get nauseated on it. They tend to move towards the middle of the roller coaster, mainly so that when they puke, they puke on everybody. Uh, or no, no, it's not why. But it also affects their overall impression of speed. That tangential speed feels a little different to them. So as that turntable is rotating around, if we put a, that ladybug sitting on it, right? The ladybug is going to feel different speeds depending upon where she is on that record. Because it's going to depend upon how far away from the that center, right, that middle point that she's rotating around, right, for that axis of rotation of that vertex. So then what part of the turntable is moving faster, the outer part where the lady sits or the inner part? Well, it depends upon if you're talking about linear or rotational speed. As far as things go, right, with rotational speed, it's the number of rotations per minute. So if you're talking about rotational speed, you're just going to count the number of times the ladybug passes you every time it spins around. That's just bit, depending on how fast it's spinning. But linear speed is the distance traveled. So if she's on the outside of that record, she's actually traveling farther because that radius is bigger, right? That radius going from that center spot here in the middle, let me get my little drawer up here, right? If she's here, She's got maybe a radius of 1R. But if she moves out double that distance to 2R, her linear speed will increase. But the number of times she's rotating around the record doesn't change, right? When we put a record on a record player, we used to have to pick rotational speeds, right? I don't know if any of you have ever, or maybe some of you still have record players. I still have one. Um, and you can adjust that rotational speed. If you want things to sound normal, you just put it at whatever speed the record is recorded at, 33 and a third or something to that effect. If you want your record to sound like the chipmunks, you spin up the rotational speed. And then they sound like the chipmunks. And then if you want your record to sound demonic, you can just turn down that rotational speed and everything sounds slow, right? Put something like the Backstreet Boys on a record player and turn it down low and you're going to start having nightmares for weeks or maybe just putting the backstreet boys on in general will probably give most people nightmares for weeks 
So from a perspective of the high roller again, so let me go back to that picture real quick. So out here we have the high roller. When it is revolving around, when it's going around in circles, we're gonna talk about the RPM of it. That really doesn't change unless we speed up or slow down how fast it's going around. But this person out here on the edge has a specific linear speed because they're gonna travel a certain distance around this. If they get closer and move closer to the center, so now maybe whatever reason, so let's say that, that we have a second set of cars and they're on the inside, right? These people on the inside move at a different linear speed than the people on the outside. But rotational wise, they're moving at the same rotations per minute. Does that make sense to everyone? Does everyone understand what I'm kind of getting at there? That although, you know, you may, we may be rotating or going around the circle at the same speed, the distance we are away from the center because we're traveling different distances, the linear speed's a little bit different. Because this is going to come into play with torque. That's the only reason I'm covering. Right, so all parts of the turntable rotate at the same speed, but a part further away from the center travels a longer path and therefore has a greater tangential speed because speed is relative to a distance traveled. So if the ladybug is sitting for two times further out than it was originally, it's gonna travel at two times the speed. The tangential speed and the rotational speed are related, right, they're proportional but that tangential speed is gonna have more to deal with the distance you are away from the vertex or that center part of that record or whatever you're rotating around. And therefore it's gonna have a, a greater distance equaling a greater tangential speed. So in simple form, we talk about this rotational speed with this emblem, right? The, the, our great emblem here, the omega, right? Is rotational speed you move faster as the rotation speed increases, right? And like my favorite, again, I relate everything back to cartoons from the 80s. So I get good old Omega Supreme up here in the corner, holding it down because he rotates quite fastly, he transforms great. As you move away from the center of something rotating. So if we have, again, that record here, right? As you move further away from the center, your tangential speed is going to increase but your rotational speed is going to remain the same as long as it stays rotating at the same speeds. Move out twice as far, your tangential speed is twice as fast. So in the amusement park, you and your friends sit on a large rotating disc, right? There we go, those, one of those great rotating disc things. So here we have those rotate, that rotating disc. So you sit at the edge, I'm gonna put you on here. So let's see, here's Mark. Mark's sitting all the way out here on the edge. And then let's just say Stephanie. Stephanie decides that she actually doesn't wanna move all the way out to the side, but she's gonna go about halfway. So she sits here. And here's our vertex. I'm a horrible drawer at circles, so do not pick on my drawing there, please. Both of them are gonna have a radius from the center, right? So if you're sitting out here and you're going six meters per second, if she is halfway closer to the radius, that means her speed tangentially is going to be half of your speed, right? So she's actually only gonna feel like tangentially she's traveling three meters per second, but as you both rotate it, it's going around four times per minute. You're both still gonna go around four times per minute. She's just going to have a tangential speed of a little bit slower. So if you're watching it from a distance, it might seem like she's moving a little bit slower than, you know, Stephanie's moving a little bit slower than Mark is moving out on the edge, just appearance wise, but they're both rotating at the same speed. And the main difference is because Mark's traveling at greater distance. He has a greater radius around as he's traveling, greater circumference as well. 
<clears throat> so how does this play in? Why am I learning this, Mr. McKeever? This is stupid. Why am I learning about rotational speed? Well, because of torque, right? And this is not, this is torque, T-O-R-Q-U-E, not twerk, T-W-E-R-K. Those are two different things. I am going to demonstrate torque. I am never going to demonstrate twerk. You guys definitely don't need to ever see that. That would give you nightmares for years, right? Torque is a tendency of force to cause rotation. Depends on the magnitude of the force, the direction which it acts, and then the point at which an object is applied, that force is applied, so the vertex itself. So the equation for torque is torque equals the lever arm length by the force. And the lever arm is going to depend upon where the force is applied and the direction which it acts. Well, why is this important? Well, because all of us have had that time where we're trying to get a stupid screw loose or a bolt loose or something like that, and we just can't get it loose. And we're like, God dang, why is this thing not coming loose, right? And you're putting all your force in, or maybe you're opening a jar, and the jar is just not coming loose. And you pass it to somebody else and like, what are you talking about, pop, right? Well, it all depends upon how much torque you're applying to get these things loose. In the first picture here, the lever arm is less than the handle because of the direction of force, right? We have a little bit different direction of force. We have an angle that's going to apply that force, stuff like that. In the second picture, the lever arm is equal to the length of the handle because, again, we're applying it in a very specific straight up and down manner. And then the third picture, if we lengthen that lever arm, we get even greater torque, right? Out here, this is what in the, uh, the, car, uh, the car world we call the BFW, right? I, I'll let you figure out what BF stands for, but the last part is wrench. That's when we can't finally get things loose. You break out the BFW to get it loose. Right? That's usually that one giant wrench handle that everyone has in their drawer somewhere to scream at stuff as they're trying to break them loose. But you can also affect the way that you apply force just by changing the direction you apply it. If I pull up at an angle, my force is going to be lessened is if I pull it up at a 90 degree kind of direct line, kind of a perpendicular line to things. So that comes into play with opening a, a bottle or a jar or something like that, right? If I start way over here and try to twist it, I may have affected the amount of torque I can apply based upon the angle I put my arm at, because now my arm's at a 45. If I come straight at a 90 and open it, I may actually be able to open it at a greater ease than if I did it out there. I can also increase it by increasing my friction force by putting something under my hand, like a towel or one of those grippy surfaces to help open it. Right? Or I could just apply more force, get a greater amount of strength going and twist that bottle both ways in order to open that bottle. Um, I had this the other day, and I don't know who designed Gatorade bottles, but I'm pretty confident they designed them that old people should never open them. I don't know what it is about just Gatorade bottles, but it seems like Gatorade bottles themselves, they're all designed so that you, you literally have to be a giant in order to open them. I feel bad for like the old person here, have a Gatorade. Like, yeah, I can't open this. What are you talking about? I'll just drink water. So the more torque you apply, the greater force you're applying. How does that play into physical therapy? Well, let's think about that for a second, right? So if I am working with a patient and I want to strengthen their arm and I'm having them do shoulder flexion, so they're coming up straight up like a shoulder flexion here. If I put a ton of force out here on the distal arm, that's going to be really hard for them to resist. And maybe if I'm working with Alec, that's okay. He's got some strength. He can resist way out there. But if you're working with good old Bob, who's 90 years old, and you're putting your force way out here, you have put that lever arm so long that Bob can't resist you. And every time you're pushing, he's just breaking every time. It's like, I can't resist that. What are you doing to me, Sonny? So you've got to think about this torque idea when you're working with patients. Another thing, let's say I'm standing up from a chair here, right? And I've got arms. 
depending upon where I put my arms on my hands on that chair arm will depend upon how to maximize my force to help me stand up. If I put them way back here, I put myself at a mechanical disadvantage. My shoulders are ready to pop out a joint, right? Where I can't really get a lot of force to help me stand up. If I put them more at a 90 degree angle, I can now really use those to help me stand up. And I see it all the time with older folks when they're getting ready to get up, right? They put their arms way back here because they're trying to grab a hold of that back armrest. And if they, if they can even get there, and they're trying to push up, but they don't have a maximized force to help them stand up. So we're like, hey, Bob, go ahead and move your arms forward a little bit. Oh, that feels better on my shoulder already. Good, now push up. Whoa, that was so much easier. So that comes into play with this torque idea, right? Doing pull-ups is another example, right? Is it harder to do pull-ups with a wide grip or a narrow grip? Why is it easier to pull with a wide grip? You're right. It's kind of counterintuitive, though. Because you would think with a narrow grip, you're at a more kind of 90 degree angle for the biceps. There we go. That's exactly right, Josh, right? So aren't that narrow grip? Yeah, the biceps have a greater mechanical advantage, but the biceps are a tinier muscle, right? If I can go out here and go wide, I can flare out my lats, right? And now my lats have a really, really good angle of pull so they can really assist my biceps in doing that pull up with me, right? So does that mean that if I move my grip in more narrow, I'm working more of my biceps than my lats? What do you think? Usually, yeah, right? Now, it doesn't completely isolate them, right? We can't say that if I just do my pull-ups here, the only muscles I'm using are my biceps because I'm also gonna use a little bit of posterior delt and there's all kinds of other things that go along with that. And rhomboids, exactly. We can't isolate. It's, you never truly isolate a muscle, right? There's always assisters that are helping with it. But we that, that comes into play. Let's say you're scraping ice off of a windshield. This torque idea also comes into play. So ice is this time when water freezes. I know that we can't think about that right now because it's 90,000 degrees outside, right? But in winter, ice may form on your vehicle, especially if you're on the East Coast. And depending upon the angle that you attack that ice at will depend upon how easy that ice breaks off your windshield. It's dealing with this torque idea. So that comes into play then with center of mass and center of gravity, right? The center of mass is the average position of all the mass that makes up the object. The center of gravity is the average position of weight distribution. So in this case, since weight and mass are usually proportional, the center of gravity and the center of mass typically refer to the same part. But if you get in stuff like water, the center of gravity and the center of mass may be thrown off slightly. So if you're trying to determine the center of gravity, suspend an object from a point and draw a vertical line from the suspension point. Repeat and then suspend it. The center of gravity lies where the two lines intersect. For the human body, most of our center of gravity and center of our mass falls somewhere in our pelvis, right? Because the pelvis is our main weight bearing structure of our body. It distributes the weight through our legs and also up and through our trunk and up through our back. That's the pelvis's job, right? It's made up of those two innominate bones that help support our body. So with center of mass and center of gravity, if I'm sitting here in my chair, right? My center of gravity is kind of passing directly through the middle of my, I have a vertical gravity line. It's passing through the middle of my head, going down through my body, passing through my pelvis where my pelvis is sitting on my chair. What happens if I lean forward? Does that change my center of gravity? Yeah, right? Does that, could I lean so far forward that I now move my center of gravity outside my pelvis? Yes. Yeah, definitely, right? And if I move it too much, what could possibly happen to me? Yeah, I could fall, right? This is gonna come into play with patients, right? We're gonna work on teaching them to bring their center of mass over their pelvis. 
think of a pregnant patient, for example, right? Pregnant patient, one of the big problems they have is, well, babies in belly, right? Now, if I have belly, a belly out like this, that's gonna affect my center of mass, which is gonna affect that vertical gravity line. And I have a tendency to pull a little bit forward. So mom, what mom has to do is actually rock her pelvis back a little bit, right? Go a little bit into posterior pelvic tilt in order to bring her center of gravity and center of mass back within her pelvis. So mom doesn't teeter and totter and fall over, right? Do you have a question mark? Oh, no. Okay, I just making sure. This happens with kids as well, right? We've all watched little babies when they first learn to walk. Do babies fall all over the place when they're learning to walk? Sure. Right, they're big heads. Yeah, right, that big head is now, their center of mass is actually located closer to their chest versus their center of gravity still in their pelvis, which means they've got a mismatch. And so now they, they tilt a little bit outside of that center of gravity and right, they're falling all over the place, right? So the more that we can actually teach patients to maintain that center of mass over their center of gravity, the less falls they have. And if we can reduce falls, we can reduce fractures. If we can reduce fractures, we can reduce hospitalizations. And believe it or not, if we can reduce hospitalizations, yeah, it is because they're top hip, right? Exactly. Because that head is up there and the body hasn't kind of developed proportionally to the head, right? And that makes sense. Our brain's going to start developing first because as our brain develops, it's going to cause everything else to develop, right? And if you look at children that maybe have problems with their brain, maybe they have microcephalus, which means small head, right? The rest of their body doesn't develop normal either because the, as the brain grows and as the head grows, the rest of the body grows. It's kind of the way we're designed, right? As that neural tube, which is what our spinal cord starts off as and our brain starts off as, as that continues to develop, we grow with it. Right? And that's what gets us to our certain heights. And we're all at the height we're supposed to have. If you're short, you're not short. You're the perfect height. You're exactly the way you're intended to be. I always wanted to be over six feet. That just wasn't in the cards for me, unfortunately. That's okay. That just means your center of gravity is closer to the ground, Alec. Think of it that way. You're less likely to fall. That actually played into my part when I was when I played football way back in the day because I have real I have a pretty long torso, but my legs are pretty short to be hundred percent honest. And that meant that my center of gravity was closer to the ground, which meant I was harder to bring down. And especially if I kind of squatted down and got down into more of a, a lower stance, it was a lot harder to bring me down. Same thing when I did martial arts; it was a lot harder to throw me if I was able to get my center of gravity and center of mass down. So we can use those to our advantages with patients. For us, we can also use our center mass as PTAs and our center of gravity to help move patients out of bed. We can rock back in our own pelvis, shift our own weight backwards, and by doing that, pull the patient out of bed. So we're gonna talk about using those body mechanics again to help us get better at moving patients. So now we're gonna talk about centripetal force, which comes into play with torque, right? Centripetal force on an object depends upon the object's tangential speed, its mass, and the radius. So this is gonna come into play, especially when we're doing stuff like driving, because centripetal force is gonna determine how much power the cars put down the road. It's gonna come into play when we do things like spinning out blood and stuff like that. So remember that velocity itself we talked about those vectors versus scalars. A scalar is just a number, right? A vector involves both a number and a direction. So velocity is both speed and direction. If I'm traveling down the road at 50 miles an hour, that's just a scalar. If I'm going 50 miles an hour north, that's my true velocity. So that means when an object is moving in a circle, even at a constant speed, it's undergoing constant acceleration and changes in velocity because it's constantly changing direction, right? I've mentioned that with the NASCAR cars on a track, right? They may be traveling 200 miles an hour consistently, but because they're constantly changing directions, their velocity is constantly changing. 
the change in direction is due to a net force. Otherwise, objects would just continue to go in a straight line, right? When we turn our cars around corners, we create a force by adjusting the angle of our wheels, which adjusts the friction force on the road, which causes our car to go around corners. So that means any object moving in a circle undergoes an acceleration that is directed towards the center of the circle. This is called centripetal acceleration. You can feel this when you go around corners, right? We've all felt it where it feels like we're being pulled as we're going around corners. The location of center of gravity is important for the stability of an object as it's going around a corner, right? If we draw a straight line down through the center of gravity, falls inside of it, it increases that center of gravity, right? So that centripetal, meaning towards the center. The force is directed towards a fixed center that causes an object to follow a circular path, right? If I were to take something on a string right now, uh, do I have anything on a string here? Oh. I've got a USB cable here. There we go, right? The USB cable's got an end to it. As I spin it around in a circle, right? I have to keep a constant force pulling on this string. So if I don't, I let off, the string stops spinning. Right? So I'm constantly pulling on that string in order to allow it to keep spinning around in a circle. Right? The string itself is going to transmit the centripetal force pulling this outside part of my USB cord in towards my fingers so it keeps moving in this nice, perfect circle. If I speed it up, it changes the cone of the circle. So I don't think I do it with this stupid cord because it's not very flexible. There we go. As I speed it up, the cone changes. So if I slow it down, it may start going around the outside of my hand a little bit more. That's the idea of centripetal force, that pull towards the center. So the force exerted on a whirling can is towards the center. No outward force is acting upon the can, so there's nothing pushing it outward. It's all being pulled towards the center by that gravitational pull. Here we have a person doing that, I forget what that's called there, but where they throw those stupid steel balls really far. So centripetal forces can be exerted a number of ways, right? The string that holds the moon to the earth is gravity, right? If right now the center of the earth stops spinning, we would lose a lot of our nuclear mass in the center of our earth. Because of that, the moon would lose its gravitational pull to us. It would actually just keep going away from us forever. If the sun suddenly lost its mass, we would stop rotating around the sun, right? Or revolving around the sun. So electrical forces provide centripetal force acting upon the electron and then neutron, or the proton, which you talked about today, right? The electron being that negative charged particle, the proton being the positive charged particle, opposites attract, so there is a gravitational pull between them that keeps those electrons moving around. Two in that inner valence, and then eight on those outer valences. Anything that moves in a circular path is acted upon by a centripetal force, right? It's not a basic force of nature, but it's the label given to any force that is directed towards a fixed center. So if the motion is circular and executed at constant speed, it occurs at a tangent or a right angle to the path of the moving object. So here's a, a, a kind of real life example of that, right? As you go around a curved path, as you go around that curve, right, for the car to go around it, there must be sufficient friction on your tires in order to keep you going around that curve, right? So the tires have to have sufficient tread. You have to be going at a, the rated speed for the curve based upon the weight of your vehicle. But let's say instead you're going around that curve and your tires are bald, so they can no longer keep a nice sufficient friction. What's going to happen? you're gonna skid off to the side, away from it, and not be able to maintain that nice curve, right? I know that several of us probably think when we go out, get off on exit ramps where it says 35 miles an hour, we're like, hmm, that's just a, a good uh, recommendation. I wonder how fast I can actually take it. And you break out the, the too fast and too furious in yourself, and you go around the corner, and suddenly you're going around the corner too fast, and you feel your car is kind of starting to skip around that corner and your tires going er, 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 as you're going around, you may have to slow down a little bit. If all of a sudden you lock up your brakes because you get scared, 
you're going to change that friction and just go sliding way off because you lose that centripetal force holding you on the curve. So that's that idea of centripetal force. It's going to keep pulling into the center so you can make a full rotation around or revolution around that corner. The sharper the corner, and that's what I was going to talk about, Alec. There, there we go. That's where I, you, you and I are on the same page here because I was getting ready to talk about Tokyo Drift. Right? So how does drifting occur then? Because that's actually a, a cool topic that we, we could, that's physics related in, as far as cars go. Well, what's drifting is doing is literally pushing that car to its literal centripetal force limit. And for those of you that don't know what drifting is, it's a sport where basically people destroy tires. That's really what the sport's designed to do. Um, but the idea is pushing your car and sliding it through corners as much as you can slide it through it. That drifting is literally pushing those tires to the absolute limits of that centripetal force. And you can tell that by the people that screw up, right? They'll push that and maybe they go just a little bit faster than they should through those corners as they're sliding and that car just spins out, right? Because they've gone beyond the, that pull of that imaginary pull to the center that holds them in that place as they're sliding around corners. Now, are tires gonna be kind of baldish and wearing off as they're doing drifting? Sure, right? But even those tires, even if they're perfectly slicks, right, from you know, a drag strip or something like that, they still have a certain amount of friction they're gonna impart upon the road. And that road surface is also gonna depend upon it. If you've got a nice hot road surface, depending upon what that material is made out of, whether it's a sticky asphalt or a slick asphalt, drifting and sliding can be a little easier, but you also have to have a better control in order to pull it off, right? So theoretically, even if I go out here and I start losing my car, as this is going, there are tricks that I can do to help pull myself back in line to get myself back into that slide, right? And we have that on the East Coast a lot when we get ice because ice reduces the friction on the road. And so a lot of, the, 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 a lot of us that grew up on the East Coast, and maybe some of you did, right? You speed up and you point the car in the direction you wanna go, right? And what that does is that takes, the force off of that centripetal spinning force and puts you into a linear force again and keeps you going straight. The downside to that is if I'm sliding like this car here is, and I correct it by going in a straight line, well, then I can end up over here in the grass, but at least I don't hit the wall that's out here. And you can see that even when you're watching stuff like NASCAR or F1 or any of the racing that's out there, right? The last thing that those people really want to do is strike that outside wall. Because usually if you hit that outside wall, you hit the inside wall, you hit the outside wall, and you just kind of ping pong between them, right? Their goal is usually to get to the inside where they can either pull into the grass or something to that effect. Uh, the washing machine is brought up as well here, right? The spin cycle in a washing machine is very similar. As that cycle, the, that uh, washing machine rotates around its internal axis, the clothes are revolving around the outside of the drum. Right? And as it revolves around the outside of that drum, the clothes are feeling an internal pull into the inside that's keeping them in there. But the water itself is has going through the outside holes and flying off in tangents to get the water out of the clothes. So the greater the speed and the greater the mass requires a greater centripetal force. That's why if you go around a corner really fast, you better have good friction. Or if you have a very large vehicle like my truck, my truck is may have be great for going in a straight line, and it is pretty good for going in a straight line. But I go around corners, and I can feel that truck kind of lean, and as I go around corners. Now that like you know, I also ride motorcycles, and I think it's Josh that also has a motorcycle, if I remember correctly, right? We can counter that when you ride motorcycles by leaning into the curve. And what you're doing then is adjusting your mass to move with that centripetal force. That's also cutting down on that radius of the corner, right? That's apexing the corner if you're really into kind of racing type stuff like that. If you travel a smaller radius, it's gonna require greater centripetal force, but you can carry speed through that corner better. So this idea of the force centripetal or F subscript C is measured in Newtons because all force is measured in Newtons, right? When the mass of the object is measured in kilograms, the velocity in meters per second, and the radius in meters. 
So we literally can calculate how much centripetal force is being generated by a car traveling at a certain speed around a certain radius curve. That's how those signs come up on the interstate and stuff that say this exit is a 35 mile an hour exit. What they're saying is an average vehicle traveling off this exit, if you travel over 35 miles an hour, may have trouble going around the corner. And so then we get into the, well, what's an average vehicle? Are we talking about an average vehicle from the 50s? And we probably should update a lot of our uh, off-ramps because vehicles have changed weight since back when we started putting those signs up. You know, a lot of those speed limits for curves are based off vehicles that are a lot heavier. And so now can a smaller, lighter vehicle take those corners a lot better? Sure, right? You go off on a corner with my truck that's, you know, a half ton pickup versus something like a McLaren. A McLaren can zip around that corner because it weighs next to nothing compared to my truck. So this is looking at this conic pendulum idea, right? Because this we're gonna deal with with the shoulder a lot, right? So a conic pendulum is a bob held in a circular path by a string attached above. So if I take this string here and let me see if I can, or this is a USB cord, but it's still a string. Let me see if I can get this to work. We'll see. All right, there we go. I got my brain attached to the USB cord here, right? And as I spin it in a circle, I can create a cone with it, right? And it's gonna go around, it's not a perfect cone, it's more like an ellipse right now. But I can create a cone with it by pulling on a certain force. Has anyone seen people in the clinic do Codman's exercises or pendulum exercises with the shoulder? For those of you that are techs. Josh says, yeah, right? So that's where we're going to have them lean over and kind of let gravity kind of pull their shoulder in circles, right? What we're doing at that point is loosening up the shoulder, right? That's kind of the idea, especially post-surgery for rotator cuffs or stuff like that. We're using this idea of a centripetal force to distract the shoulder slightly and loosen up all those muscles that are probably tight from surgery or just tight from something like a frozen shoulder. So in this case of this pendulum, right, there are two forces acting upon it, one force due to gravity, right, and the force due to the mass and tension of the spring or the spring or the cord or whatever I'm pulling on. So there is this whole adding vectors thing that's in your book. See, I'm gonna make you guys feel better because this looks complicated. This is just like Dr. Johnson's one part. This is an FYI if you wanna know how it works, right? But what this kind of tells us is if I can get the patient to do smaller circles, it's going to create less of an impact on that shoulder than if I have them making huge bobbing circles because the radius of that circle is lessened, which means they require less force to maintain that centripetal circle. So if I just have them doing little baby circles as they're leaning over the table, it's a lot easier for them to maintain that. It also provides a good amount of force to pull that shoulder out a little bit, and loosen up that shoulder. Don't worry about adding all this together, please. This is just part of the book that I wanted to use as an example for that type of thing. So here I, I'm going back to my favorite sport because I'm a redneck and going back to NASCAR. And for those of you that are going, oh God, he keeps talking about NASCAR. Well, yeah, centripetal force keeps a vehicle in a circular path as it rounds the curve, right? In NASCAR, how do they keep up their high speeds? Well, a couple of ways. They put tires on that keep them sticking to the track. The track itself has a certain amount of stickiness. And then they also add banking to the curve, right? So as the cars are going around the curve, they go around a banking, right? Uh, this top track here, I believe this is Dover is the picture I have here. But the, as they're going around the curve, they have a 31 degree angle from the base, right? And even straightaways in a lot of them aren't exactly perfectly flat. So if we can create this tendency for the vehicle to either slide up nor down the curve, friction keeps place no role in keeping the vehicle on the track. At that point, it's just centripetal force, the mass and the gravity. And therefore that car can go around that corner a lot faster than it would in a normal case if the corner was flat. So that's why they create those banks on the uh, tracks. 
if you ever get a chance to like go up to the NASCAR track here in town, it's really wild if you get to walk out on the corners because it's actually really difficult to walk up those corners because of the embankment. It's not, you would think it's easier, but then you think about these, you know, 4,000 pound cars or something like that traveling around these corners at 200 miles an hour. Well, there's a lot of forces, specifically centripetal, working on those cars to hold them on the tracks. So while we have that centripetal force, which we can calculate, there's also this thing called the centrifugal force effect, right? It's not a true force, but it's a feeling of a force. It's a force created by your own inertia, right? Sometimes referred to as an outward force. It's what you feel when you get on one of those cars, right? If you go around a corner really fast, you feel like your body is being pulled out to the side. That is that centrifugal force. It's not a true force of nature, but it's the idea that inertia is going to keep trying to move you off to the outside, while centripetal force is going to keep trying to pull you to the inside to keep you where you are. Centrifugal means center fleeing or away from the center, right? So in this case, if I'm spinning this brain around, if all of a sudden this USB cord would break, the brain would fly off in a straight line whichever way it goes right? It wouldn't keep spinning around in a circle because at that point, there's no centripetal force holding it in place. It will flee from the center and travel along a centrifugal line. Uh, Mark mentioned earlier that carnival ride that everyone gets on where you sit on, the, you go against the wall and it spins around. And as it's spinning around, you kind of get squished up against the wall, right? And as you get squished up against the wall, they can drop the floor out from under you and you stay on the wall. As that's spinning around, the people that have greater mass, because their inertia is greater, feel the effects of that spin a lot more than somebody that's smaller, right? When you have a smaller, lighter person, they don't feel that effect as much, right? And sometimes those people can move it up and down the walls a lot easier than those of us that are huge that are like squished against the wall going, okay, this sucks, I can't breathe anymore. Because our inertia is saying, we need to go off in a straight line while the centripetal force of that machine is saying, no, I'm going to hold you here, right? So if we take a whirling can, right? We often think that centrifugal force is pulling outward on the can. It's not really, it's the inertia of the can that's causing. The can has a certain amount of mass. That mass wants to stay going in a straight line based on Newton's first law. So if we take that can, if I have a big enough can, and I put Mark in it, and Mark stands against the bottom of the can, and I start spinning him around, he's going to feel a force that's almost like gravity that will allow him to stand almost vertical in the can as it's going around in circles. But really what that is, is that's his own mass saying, I'm trying to move off in a straight line. Well, that centripetal force is keeping him going in that circle. That's that idea of the uh, that spinning carnival ride. Theoretically, if you can get yourself to the point where you can get your feet under you on that ride, you can theoretically stand up straight and be almost horizontal with the ground as that centripetal force is keeping you going in that circle. I wouldn't recommend it because as soon as they slow down, you're in a face plant. But at least for the time being, you could theoretically stand against that wall. So here we have a ladybug in the can, right? As that ladybug's out there, she does feel that certain centrifugal force pulling her out, but the centripetal force is keeping her moving in that circle. That's that force holding the can, spinning her around like this, right? At this point, this brain that I'm spinning around is feeling a force pushing itself towards the outside. But in reality, what it's feeling is its own desire to move in a straight line, its own inertia. That's the idea of that centripetal or centrifugal force. We use this in things like centrifuges for separating blood because we know that blood itself has different masses. The white blood cells have a certain mass, the red blood cells have a certain mass, and the plasma has a certain mass. So we can put a vial of blood in a centrifuge. And what that centrifuge does is it spins rapidly and that centripetal force is holding it to the center of that centrifuge as it's spinning around. But the weight of the different blood cells will separate in that vial because they're all going to try to escape at a different speed. 
once it's separated, we can actually then separate out white blood cells from red blood cells from plasma and take counts of that on the patient where they can actually calculate, you know, they could calculate what Jimmy's red blood cell count is, what his white blood cell count is, and what his plasma counts are in order to help determine how healthy his blood is. So again, centrifugal force is not necessarily an effect of rotation itself, it's an effect of the inertia, right? So that's why we don't consider centrifugal force a true force in physics. It is just a relationship of that spinning to our own inertia. The true force at that point is the centripetal force, which is keeping things spinning around in circles. I was going to keep this toy forever, looking me occupied all day. So centrifugal force pierces force in its own right, as real as the pull of gravity to us when we feel it. When we go around that corner, of the car, go around a corner really fast in a car, we feel that desire to push us to the outside of that corner. But really, what again that is is that's our own inertia saying. And we want to move off in that direction, right? There is this fundamental difference between gravity-like centrifugal forces and actual gravity, because gravity is the interaction between one mass and another, the interaction between our mass and the mass of the Earth, right? In rotational references, centrifugal force has no agent such as mass, so there's no interactive counterpart. The only thing that's holding that person in place is that centripetal force that we're enacting, like here, on my string as I'm spinning around, I'm, the brain evidently has escaped now. So observers who are in a rotating system, if you're in that kind of that carnival ride, that, centri that centrifugal force feels real to you. But in reality, it's just a relationship to your mass of the spinning. It's not a true force pulling on you. So here we have an idea where person sitting in the middle and they're spinning around in a circle and they have a heavy iron ball attached to a spring. Two observers, one in the rotating frame and then one in the outside are gonna see the spring being stretched outward away from them, right? So as that spins around, that ball is gonna slowly pull away from the person in the center, right? So at that point, the person in the center says, well, that ball's being pulled away from me. So there's gotta be a force pulling me away. But in the outside, when the person looking in just sees that ball going around in a circle, so they only see that centripetal force of the spring pulling it, keeping that ball in place. So when we look at this, only the observer in a rest frame can identify a reaction of pair of forces. That's kind of the idea here. You can't necessarily determine what forces are acting upon yourself when you're having those forces acting upon yourself. It has to be observed from an exterior angle. And that's it, that was a lot. Oh God. So what do we learn? Well, there's a lot of stuff to learn here. Stephanie's brain is fried, I can see your face, right? So what we learn is that there are two different types of rotate, or two types of circular motion, revolution and external access, rotation and internal access. Those revolutions and rotations will then create forces that allow us to go around in circles, right? Centripetal, that force pulling us into the center, and centrifugal force, which is that force we feel when we're being pushed out to the outside. If I spin around in this chair fast enough, eventually I'm going to spin so fast, I'm going to fly off the chair, right? And all that is, is it's not a true force. What that is, is it's my body's inertia saying, get off, you idiot. You're, you shouldn't be doing that in the first place, right? What happens if I were to take Stephanie right now and grab her by the wrist and spin her around in circles? Well, she's going to start lifting up off the ground. She's going to feel a force pulling her out to the outside, but at the same time, feel the force of my hands pulling her in to keep her spinning around in a circle. That force she feels pulling her out is her inertia, the centrifugal force. The force pulling her in my hands is her centripetal force. But what happens if I suddenly let go when we're spinning around in circles? Well, she's not going to keep spinning around me. She's going to go off in a straight line, right, Mark? Exactly. And fly off and hopefully not smash into a wall. Right? We've all done that with a little kid, right? Where we've accidentally let go as they're going and they just kind of go <laughs> flying. Maybe just me. Maybe it's only me. Okay. I've never done that to a little kid. Never done that to my godchild ever. Um, okay. Yeah, <laughs> never, never happened, right? Yeah, so great question, Justin. Josh, so there's no gravity. There wouldn't really be a centrifugal force, right? No, 
right? That's why when we have something like the International Space Station, it has to create artificial gravity in order to spin down stuff in space, right? They have to actually create their own gravitational pull by spinning the space station in order to actually do anything. So if they're analyzing how blood works in space, they have to create artificial gravity in order to spin down blood. Yeah. That's actually a really good question, right? So if you're just up, say you're in a, say you're in the space shuttle out in space, you would not feel any centrifugal force if somebody was able to spin you around in a circle. You would never feel that force pulling you out. You just keep going around in circles because there'd be no true inertia acting upon you. Yeah, great question. And not how you spin around in circles either in space. That'd be something fun. Maybe rocket boosters, I don't know. All right, guys. That's it for today. I know that was a uh, really roundabout subject.